خب um, سلام بر همگی hello everyone it is an honor to host a panel today with my esteemed colleagues in Iran and the participants from all around the world working on different Persian related fields. We will have six presenters today who will talk about their chapters in my recently published volume, The Routledge Handbook of Second Language Acquisition and Pedagogy of Persian. Please keep your microphones off at all time during the panel. You can write your questions in the chat section and mention who it is for, and I will read them to the participants in the Q&A period at the end of the panel. Please also note that this panel is recorded. So if you prefer, you can keep your videos off as well. I will introduce each panelist before their presentation, and then we will listen to their talk. Once all talks are finished, I will read the questions from the chat section to the panelists. Once again, thank you very much for participating in today's panel. The first presenter is um, Dr. Behruz Mahmoudi Bakhtiari, who is an Associate Professor of Linguistics and Persian at the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Tehran. He received his PhD in Linguistics from Allama Tabo Tabo'i University in 2004. His major fields of research are Persian linguistics and Iranian dialectology, as well as discourse analysis of drama and fiction. He is the author of the books, of the books Tense in Persian 2002, Farsi Bia Muzim, or Let's Learn Persian 2003, Persian for Dummies 2015, Panda Parsi, or Listening Comprehension of Persian 2016, and Salam Doktor, Dialogue Activities of Persian, together with several articles in journals and reference books, such as World's Major Languages 2006, Oxford Handbook of Persian Linguistics 2018, Encyclopedia Iranica 2003 and the Encyclopedia of Islam 3rd edition 2015. He will present his paper on second language acquisition of grammar. Dr. Bakhtiari, you can start. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome everybody. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shabani Jadidi for arranging this meeting. It's a great pleasure to be once again together in the presence of all the friends and colleagues once again. Uh, since I'm very short of time, uh, let me go very quickly to the idea of what I have written and uh, what I wanted to say. I had the pleasure of writing the 10th chapter of this book, which was dealing with uh, the challenges of teaching grammar to non-Iranian students, especially the English-speaking students. Uh, well, you know that every language learner is obliged to unconsciously compare the new language he or she is learning with his or her native language. And error analysis may be a good method to pave the way for the production of useful grammar books and exercises. My rather long experience of teaching Persian has given me the sense that some specific areas of Persian grammar look more different and difficult to foreigners, especially the English speakers. And in this chapter, I aim to catalog the primary issues facing the Persian language instructor working with English speaking students. Uh, the, the major issues that I have covered in this chapter mainly deal with definiteness for nouns, raw and its several grammatical and discourse functions, the as of a construction, the quasi impersonal constructions, uh, the ellipsis and complex uh, predicates. I have started with Persian morphology. I'm not going to take the time to introduce the Persian issues uh, in terms of morphology, but I wanted to say that the issues of nominal morphology of Persian that I covered here uh, include number derivative suffixes, including diminutives and definite markers, the case relations and markings, the postposition draw, the pronouns and reflexive cases, and uh, other issues. I started with the fact that there are some uh, uh, nominal cases that usually this, the English speaking students uh, have difficulties with. For example, uh, it's strange for them that simple Persian nouns act as generic nouns. For example, when we say inja kitab arzan ast, uh, or when we say ma muallem hastim, they expect uh, the word to be pluralized when it is not. And it is noteworthy that in modern standard Persian, ha has mo almost totally replaced on and in some uh, uh, very uh, special cases, 
they are different. For example, when we say agayan, bozorgan, digaran, saran, uh, and things like that. Because most of the words in Persian can be pluralized with ha. However, there are some issues which are not. And uh, sometimes, uh, in, in case the subject is inanimate, the verb may remain singular, such as sahtaman ha kharab shod, as opposed to gorg ha be galle hamle kardand. So animacy is at work here in terms of the cases dealing with uh, plurality. Uh, also, it's, it was interesting for the students when uh, we use the cardinal numbers and the Persian nouns remain singular. For example, when we say yek medad and we say dah medad and yek milyun medad and the word is not pluralized. Noun classifiers such as uh, ta, dane, ras and things like that, such as do ta dukhtar, dah dane kitab, se ras gusfan, dah halqe tayer and things like that, are also the issues that the foreign students seem to be complaining uh, because uh, well, they usually do not make use of them in their own languages. A clear difference between English and Persian plural system is that English plurals, uh, Persian plurals can be used with mass nouns or with infinitives to indicate the large sum of something. For example, in non ha, which means this amount of bread, or mashru khordan ha u, which means his excessive amount of drinking, are also acceptable in Persian. In terms of definiteness, I, I have covered some issues. Uh, which are very interesting, at least in my idea, because there are some items in Persian which are inherently definite, such as demonstrative pronouns, personal pronouns, and proper names, as well as demonstrative adjectives, superlatives, and ordinals. For example, when we say medad ha, avvalin nafar, or behtarin sha'er, which are in inherently definite and do not require to be, uh, to receive any definite marker. In terms of case relations and markings, well, you know that Persian cases are indicated by either the ad positions or the verb agreement or the word order. And this is also another challenge for the English speaking students uh, who have been used to see uh, every word in their own places and they are not very much familiar with issues such as a scrambling in Persian. Uh, well, I have covered some basic uh, some, uh, I have covered some basic primary prepositions and because of the shortage of time I, I have to skip them because I, I would like to uh, cross to some other more important issues and I, I would like to say that in spite of the fact that many people believe that raw in Persian does not necessarily uh, as uh, definitely direct of the market and prefer to keep it as a definite marker. I have found some issues which has already been definite and again it receives a raw marker. Uh, Something which is very important and many of the English speaking students have problems with is that can appear after personal reflexive and Again, this is something which is not appearing in English, and many of the students, in, in, in their effort to find uh, an equivalent to them, face some problems. Uh, for negative indefinite pronouns, which are hitch cast, hitch cheese, and hitch jaw, we have something which is um, something which is very, very important, and, he, and it is the uh, negative form of them. Hame kazayeshan ra khordan will turn to hech kas kazayesh ra nakhord as uh, while in english we say everybody ate their food nobody ate their food but in persian hech kas kazayesh ra nakhord both of them are negativized inja hame chiz hast inja hech chiz nist in kitab hame jo peyda mi shavad in kitab hech jo peyda nemi shavad uh, another issue which is uh, important in my opinion is that Persian does not have independent relative pronouns and the general complementizer K works uh, and does this function and uh, this again seems to be a problem for many of the foreign speaking students. 
in terms of the reflexive cases, I would like to draw your attention to something which is very important, that khud by, by no means is not equivalent to self. Because we say khudam khudash, khudat khudash, and we can make use of khud as it is. For example, u khud ra kusht, man khud ra dost daram, lutfan khud ra bezahmat nayandazid. While self cannot appear this way uh, without any ending in English. And, uh, more interesting in spoken Persian is that you can even insert something within the, the reflexive pronoun construction. For example, Bezorit Khode Sang Delesh Hambedune, which seems to be a, an issue we usually refer to as parasitic gap in syntax, which is not the issue that we can cover here. In terms of verbal morphology, I have covered the modal verbs and I have talked about the verbs tabonestan, gozoshtan, behtar budan, mumkin budan, and the frozen modals bayad and shayad, uh, which are very important and many of them are uh, uh, very complicated for uh, the foreign students. Uh, another issue that I have covered, according to my own experience, are uh, the impersonal constructions such as chare inis bayad raft mi shavad hame chiz ha ra negah dasht mi tawan nishast va muntazir mon and uh, then i have covered the issues that said yusuf 2018 has referred to as quasi impersonal idioms such as bist salam ast kitab giram nemi ayat sardam shode ast khabam bord and things like that uh, i hope i have uh, two or three more minutes to wrap up. Uh, in terms of syntax, I have uh, dealt with the typology of Persian. As you know, uh, Persian in a, is an SOV language, while uh, English is an SVO language, and that is quite clear that the two languages should be different in terms of uh, word order. However, some issues in Persian and English seem to be uh, alike. Uh, after that, I have dealt with the Ezafe marker and have said that is issues such as Ketab Reza or, or Keke Khoshmaze show the form of N, N, and N, N, N adjective both. And it, is, it was very strange for the students that there is a, a connective here needed uh, to connect the words and it is different from uh, good boy or beautiful girl. Also, as of a marker has some other functions, for example, between first and family names, such as Abbasi Kyarostami. And, uh, and I have said that if Professor Noam Chomsky were Iranian, his name would be Noam Chomsky. Uh, so uh, this is something that we basically have in Persian. Of course, first and family names uh, do not receive the as of a marker when the name is finalized in U or A. For example, Reza Ahmadi or Minu Ghaznavi. Here we do not require a, an as of a marker. But generally speaking, as of a marker has an attributive case uh, function such as Sa'at Panj, Kitab Dastur, or Kitab Siyah, a genitive function such as Kitab Mehdi, Paye Yemiz, and then a positive function, such as Agai Akbari, Khalij Fars, Furudgah Mehrabad, or Khiyaban Jordan. Of course, title names uh, do not receive as of a marker, such as Dr. Karimi or Ustad Hakshans. Uh, in terms of the syntax of complex predicates, I have covered five categories. Uh, the first one is noun and verb, such as Atash Gereftan. Adjective and verbs such as garm gereftan, adverb and verbs such as pastadan, particle and verbs such as bargashtan, prepositional phrase and verbs such as bekar bordan. And, and I have talked about the different semantic changes that all these constructions undergo. Uh, the very final issue that I would like to cover here, and I have to, sk uh, to skip uh, all the rest of the issues, is uh, the let alone constructions, which is constructions in Persian. Umaro Baba Sedane Mikona, Chebresat be inkedastam Robusat. So as you see, it deals with uh, the different information structure that the sentence is supposed uh, to convey. Manas Gorbe Mitarsam, Chebresa Akrab. 
اون جواب سلام منو نمیده چه برسه به اینکه دستم رو ببوسه so there are so many issues which are supposed to be covered in our grammar textbooks and these are the issues that I have tried to include in the book that I, I am writing together with my uh, close friend uh, پیمان نجومیان and I hope that it appears very soon عرایز من اینجا تموم شد اجازه میخوام یکی دو جمله به فارسی عرض بکنم که من بخش عظیمی از زبانشناسی که بلدم و مدیون کسی هستم که الان در این جمع بزرگوارانه حضور داره استادم جناب آقای دکتر سید علی میرمادی از دوران لیسانس استاد بنده بودم من 22 واحد دانشجوی آقای دکتر میرمادی بودم و هرگز یادم نمیره که اگر ما چیزی از زبانشناسی بلدیم یقینا بخش بزرگیش وابسته به لطف و بزرگواری جناب دکتر میرمادی. آی دکتر میرمادی عزیز این چپتر با همه کاسی های احتمالیش با نهایت ارادت تقدیم به شما من دست شما رو میبوسم سپاسگزار هستم و از تمام شما که لطف کردیم و به عرایز شتاب زده من توجه کردید هم تشکر Thank you very much dear Behruz uh, for your very interesting um, presentation um, We're going to have our second presenter today um, Zahra, Dr. Zahra Hamedi Shirvan who is an adjunct professor of linguistics at the linguistics department and also the center of teaching Persian to speakers of other languages at Ferdowsi University of Mashhad. She received her PhD and master's in general linguistics and her bachelor in English language and literature at Ferdowsi University of Mashhad. For the 2019-2020 academic year, she has been sent by Iran's Ministry of Education to Lebanese University, Beirut, to teach Persian and linguistics at the Persian language department of Lebanese University. Her main field of study and interest are critical discourse analysis, linguistic typology, Iranian dialects, cognitive linguistics, error analysis, and second language writing research. Moreover, she has also contributed as the main author of a three volume series for teaching Persian speaking, which is under publication by Ferdowsi University of Mashhad. She will present her paper on the acquisition of Persian pragmatic competence. Zahrajan, you can go ahead. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for that introduction, dear Dr. Shabani, and my thanks to the organizers and sponsors of this webinar for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today, especially Dr. Shabani Jadidi and Dr. Mahmoudi Bakhtiari. The work that I will be rep reporting today is a case study about the comprehension of conversational implicature and, and disposition in the learners of Persian as a second or foreign language. As you know, to be competent language users, second or foreign language learners not only have to acquire grammatical accuracy, but they also must learn pragmatic appropriateness compared to other aspects of language like grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, and the four skills. Pragmatics, which is the study of language from the point of view of users, especially of the choices they make, the constraints they encounter in using language in social interaction, and the effects the, uh, their use of language has on other participants in the act of communication, has come to attention much later. Uh, the study of pragmatics deals with such areas as dioxys, conversational implicature, presupposition, conversational structure, and the objects of uh, research was to assess and in to achieve such a goal, the main research questions, the main questions uh, answered in research were, uh, does the learning context have if under Persian as a second or foreign language? By context, I, I mean learning Persian abroad or learning it inside Iran. In other words, is there a significant difference between the competence of those people learning Persian abroad and those learn uh, it in Iran? Another objective was to examine the extent of the attention 
of the Persian language teaching materials and textbook to the uh, to Persian learners understanding of conversational implication and presupposition. So one other question was to what extent the teaching materials have paid attention to pragmatic competence implicitly or explicitly. It can be said that this research was the first attempt to assess Persian learners pragmatic comprehension, uh, namely conversational implicature and presupposition and also to investigate the amount of textbooks attention to these two important pragmatic issues. Uh, about the importance of pragmatic comprehension in second language uh, acquisition, according to Canal and Suan, I can just say pragmatic ability is the ability to use language appropriately according to the communicative situation and pragmatic comprehension refers to the comprehension of oral language in terms of pragmatic meaning. Therefore, second language learners need to acquire pragmatic knowledge of the language in order to achieve some abilities. For example, the ability to understand a speaker's intentions, interpret speaker's feeling, differentiate the meaning of a speech act, evaluate the intensity of a speaker's meaning, such as the difference between a suggestion and a warning, recognize sarcasm, joking, and other facetious behavior, understand the conversational implication used in conversations by native speakers in order to respond appropriately and understand the presuppositions and the conventional meanings which are associated with certain words. The survey tool used in this study was a questionnaire developed by Tarizadeh 2017 in his PhD thesis to measure the knowledge of conversational implication and presupposition. I used the Persian translation ver version of this questionnaire with some small changes like changing the names and a few words for collecting the data. I must mention that I asked for permission from both Dr. Tarizadeh and also from his supervisor to use their questionnaire. The questionnaire contained 25 items. Uh, which the learners were asked to specify whether they agree or not with the utterances expressed in them. All the Persian learners were given 30 minutes to answer the questionnaire and the learners who answered the questionnaire online were asked not to spend more than 30 minutes on it. If I want to um, say some of the questions. For example, one question about conversational implication was that Muhammad and Sina are having lunch at the university cafe. Muhammad addresses his friend Sina and says, Asghar Farhadi's new movie is released. Me and Michael are going to watch it tomorrow or the day after. Are you coming? And Sina responds, I have two class seminars next week. On the basis of Sina's response, Mohan understand that he is going with them to the cinema. The learners should have a specified whether they agree with this difference or And uh, this question about conversational implication is targeting the magazine of relevance introduced by Grice. And uh, one question about presupposition was, Amin is talking to his brother, Bahan about what their neighbors who is very uh, who is very the man. I saw Mr. Hosseini again in a new Mercedes Benz yesterday. Only God knows how many automobiles. And Bahman replies, he is very rich, but he is not a happy man. According to this conversation, rich people are usually happy. The learners should have specified whether they agree or disagree with this presupposition. Uh, the data of the study were collected from two groups of learners. The first group consisted of 35 learners in the intermediate and higher intermediate level. Uh, who were studying Persian at Ferdos University of Mashhad. These learners were from Lebanon, Thailand, Germany, Syria, England, Iraq, and France. And the data of this group uh, were collected in two months with a questionnaire distributed in paper format. The second group consisted of 12 learners in the intermediate and higher intermediate level who were studying Persian 
at the Center of Teaching Persian, the Najaf branch in Iraq. The data of this group was collected through the same questionnaire, which was designed online on Google Forms. The learners were all from Iraq and their native speakers of Arabic. The second phase of this research includes analyzing and studying two book series of Persian for speakers of other languages in terms of the amount of attention to conversational implication and presupposition in their conversation and listening exercises. These two collections were uh, Let's Learn Persian and Modern Persian Teaching. The reason for choosing this series was that they contain elementary level books uh, to advanced level and also both series are, are used as the main source of teaching Persian in many centers and universities inside and outside Iran. According to the findings, um, there was no significant difference between the mean scores of group uh, one and group two in terms of percentage of correct answers to the question. That is, um, 59% versus 62%, nor in the percentage of the incorrect answers that, that was 32% uh, versus 38%. As I said, uh, there was no large difference between the two groups in terms of correct and incorrect responses. However, surprisingly, the average correct response of the second group, which were learning Persian outside Iran, was 3% higher than the first group, uh, which were learning Pers uh, Persian inside Iran. This can show that the intermediate level, at the intermediate level, not only had the context of learning not affected the pragmatic competence, uh, namely the learning of conversational implication and presupposition, but also even those uh, who have learned in, uh, who have not been in the context have somehow performed better in this regard. Uh, comparing the incorrect responses shows that there is a 5.5% difference between the two groups. And here the first group who were learning Persian in context inside Iran have performed better and made uh, less incorrect choices. Finally, it must be mentioned that this research uh, was a case study with some limitations and more studies with different groups of learners, different levels of proficiency, different nationalities, etc. is required to achieve more accurate and reliable results. In the second phase of this research, which was mainly a qualitative study, two book series, totally 10 textbooks were analyzed in terms of amount of attention they paid to conversational implication in the speaking uh, and listening exercises. Only um, the high intermediate and advanced books uh, contained a few exercises related to these pragmatic issues and the frequency of implicator exercises was duplicated in the advanced level book compared to the high intermediate level and this seems to be a logical development. In other words, by increasing students' knowledge of vocabulary, grammar and other structures in Persian, that is uh, the expansion of their grammatical competence, they will be more ready to practice and perform perform better on uh, pragmatic competence exercises. Totally, it can be said that little attention has been paid to the instruction of pragmatics, namely conversational implication and presupposition in these Persian language textbooks. And I will finish in just one or two minutes. Um, uh, I suggest investigating the socio-pragmatic knowledge of Persian learners will be a useful area. In other words, do learners of Persian know and use the rules that guide the use of Persian language in society and in context? Another each issue which needs to be investigated is teaching Persian pragmatics in the classroom setting. Is it possible to teach pragmatics at all or not? Factors influencing the learning of Persian pragmatics in second or foreign language learning context can also be a fruitful study. Investigating learners' knowledge and comprehension of 
other areas of pragmatics like speech acts, speech acts of request, complaint, apologies, ref refusals, seems really necessary. And analyzing the Persian textbooks and materials, which are designed for the Persian learners in terms of other aspects of pragmatics and examining how much uh, these materials are successful in teaching pragmatic aspects of Persian language, can be a continuation of the second part of this study. Another relevant and helpful issue can be exploring the relationship between learners' time spent studying Persian and their pragmatic competence. Is there any meaningful difference between the learners in terms of the time uh, spending on learning Persian and their pragmatic competence? Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this time and thank you very much for your attention and your time. Thank you very much, Zahrajan, for your very interesting presentation. Um, the you. third panelist is Dr. Musa Nushi, who is Assistant Professor of TEFL, Teaching English as a Foreign Language, at Shahid Behjti University. He obtained his PhD in TEFL from Allama Tabo Tabai University and a master's in the same field from the University of Tehran. He has been teaching English to Iranian EFL learners and teachers for almost 15 years. He taught Persian language at Portland State University in 2004 and five academic year. He has also cooperated with the SAMT Institute in the development of the new generation of English for specific purposes textbooks. He is the co-author of English for Students of Sociology and has published in international journals. He will present his paper on second language speaking. Musa. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Pune Shabani uh, Jadidi and the Institute of uh, Islamic Studies at McGill University for setting up this panel. I would, uh, I would also like to thank the audience who are attending at this uh, virtual <coughs> uh, panel session. My presentation focuses on teaching and speaking Persian um, as a second or foreign language, as um, uh, Dr. Shaboni pointed out. Now, everyone knows the importance of um, speaking in a second language. As um, you may well know, many equate knowing another language with being able to speak the language. So the first question people are likely to ask you when they hear that you know another language is, do you speak it? So um, this question points to the fact that speaking is the quintessential reflection of ability in a second language and the main criterion by which uh, success at second language learning is assessed. Researchers um, have also pointed out that speaking can facilitate L2 learning and that it can contribute to learners' academic and professional development. However, um, develop, developing speaking in a second language is an arduous task for many L2 teachers and learners. Uh, many teachers feel that their uh, classroom speaking activities are not sufficiently preparing the learners for real world communication. And, um, and although there are many materials and um, uh, pedagogical techniques available to um, second language teachers, they uh, really do not know how, to, how best to approach the teaching of oral skills. And this has been uh, the debate, I mean, the, um, the best approach has been um, discussed um, amongst uh, researchers and educators. Um, and we are um, in this chapter, no, uh, I am going to present um, some techniques that would take care of uh, some of these uh, concerns. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly, sometimes even we have the method methodology and the materials in place, learners um, are reluctant to speak in L2 classes. So we have to look for the reasons as to why they are reluctant to speak. Um, so um, I will start by um, um, discussing the characteristics of um, spoken discourse and the implications that uh, such characteristics would have for language teaching, I mean, uh, speaking in particular. 
Um, I also uh, talk about the functions of um, speaking and in uh, delineating the functions of speaking, I draw on Richard 2000, Richard's 2008 uh, three partitive uh, model of in, uh, functions of speaking. And I will use these different functions of speaking or talk as um, the backbone of this presentation. Um, so as everyone um, in this panel probably knows, um, speaking is different from written language. Um, um, speech is not spoken writing. Many languages are not spoken the way that they are written. This is uh, mostly true about Persian too, which has also been um, described as diglossic language. Um, Dr. Bakhtiri has written a chapter um, on that in um, Oxford Handbook of Persian Linguistics. Um, so this makes um, teaching of uh, Persian really difficult and challenging for many language um, teachers and learners. Um, speaking is also spontaneous. It means that um, we do not uh, plan beforehand. Of course, there are some um, instances where uh, where we plan ahead like interviews or public announcements, but mainly speaking is unplanned and uh, learners need to learn to uh, plan as they are producing or con constructing their utterances. One more characteristic of a spoken discourse is its fast delivery and compared to the written language and um, especially English language uh, seems to be a really fast paced language and learners um, who are um, um, whose uh, first language is English and they want to learn Persian um, then um, the speed causes difficulty. So um, to sound natural they have to make adjustments in their speaking to speaking rate. Also, um, speaking language uses a lot of uh, informal vocabulary fixed expressions, and these are these expressions are context dependent, culture uh, dependent, and uh, understanding them would require um, cultural background, and um, and this uh, also um, causes difficulty for uh, teaching and learning speaking. Uh, Richards um, 2008 also points out that uh, speaking is a linear, um, uh, speaking has a linear structure and the unit of uh, uh, organization is clause rather than sentence, which we see in uh, a written language. So uh, functions of speaking. Um, speaking uh, has three main functions for language learners. The first of these is um, speaking or talk as interaction, talk as uh, transaction, and talk as performance. As I said, this framework has been uh, introduced by uh, Richards, and uh, the first of these is talk as interaction. This is something that we generally know as conversation, and um, the primary function of this type of talk is uh, building and keeping social relations. Examples include chatting to next um, seat passenger during a plane flight or chatting to a school friend over a cup of tea or coffee. Um, in order to be able to, um, um, in order to be able to um, carry out this type of task uh, or talk, let's say, um, learners need to learn how to open and close conversations they need to um, choose appropriate topics. They uh, should learn a little bit of joking, uh, recounting personal experiences, turn taking, using um, adjacency part, uh, pairs and interrupting. So these are some skills that they need to learn. So if um, teachers are to teach um, talk as interaction, they have to equip learners with these skills. And um, also, uh, this type of um, talk may seem very simple on the surface, but um, um, it's really not. And uh, Richard say that um, sometimes learners feel awkward and at a loss for words when they find themselves in situations 
uh, when such type of talk is required. My personal experience um, is with a, a Japanese um, teacher of Persian who was able to talk about grammar and um, the formal features of Persian language. But when we were talking and we invited him for um, a dinner out for to eat out, he said, um, hey, I do not, um, I will accompany you, but I do not, um, man kabob goz nemizanam. So uh, you see, this is a, a conversational phrase and the professor was not able to express himself well. Um, though, as I said, he was able to um, teach Persian, I mean, the formal features of Persian. The second function of speaking is, um, or talk is, um, talk as transaction. Here we speak with our partner interlocutors in order to convey information. Uh, examples are classroom discussions and problem solving activities or uh, a class activity during which students uh, design a poster, um, discussing needed computer uh, repairs with a technician. So um, in order to be, carry, uh, to be able to carry out this type of talk, um, learners need to be equipped with skills such as explaining a need or orientation, uh, they um, need to be able to describe something, to ask questions, to ask for clarification, to confirm information, to justify an opinion, make suggestions, and so forth. So um, again, I'm um, introducing these different functions, and I'm saying that each of these um, functions require its own pedagogical approach. Um, talk as performance is um, what we know as um, public speech uh, that infra, uh, transmits information to usually live audience, uh, like what I'm doing here. This type of talk is often formal, monologic, and structured, and um, has a lot of features in common with written language. So this type of um, talk is rather formal and structured and has a lot uh, in common with the written language. Um, so examples would be uh, giving a speech of welcome or making a sales presentation or giving a lecture uh, like what I'm doing here. To carry out this type of talk, we need a pro to, know, to know the appropriate format. We need to present information in an appropriate sequence maintain audience engagement, use correct pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar. Um, so accuracy is very important here. We have to uh, be able to achieve the intended purpose of our talk. That is whether I'm going to persuade you, whether I'm going to make an, uh, uh, a request or something like that. Um, so, um, Although meaning is important in this type of talk, as I said, um, accuracy and organization is also very important. And you are evaluated, I mean, the learner is evaluated based on effectiveness or impact on the listener. Um, so as I said, recognizing the various functions that speaking performs in our daily life and determining the different pr uh, purposes for which L2 learners need speaking skills are crucial and have implications for designing speaking activities and materials. For example, to teach talk as interaction, like to um, teach talk as conversation, the best technique would be providing learners with authentic conversational discourse that model features such as opening and closing conversations, making small talk, um, recounting personal experiences and reacting to what others um, have um, are saying or others say. Um, and this is very um, important. Nowadays, there are um, uh, software that um, analyze large corpora and they uh, present material developers and teachers with a lot of um, interesting findings regarding to the features of conversation. And they are increasingly being incorporated in our textbook and, um, uh, and uh, teaching materials. 
Um, also, uh, when we talk about um, talk as interaction, there are a lot of fixed expressions called routines that help learners not only to increase their fluency, but also um, uh, make their speech uh, sound uh, natural. For example, هیچ چیزی بی حکمت نیست داشتم عرض می کردم سر تو درد نیارم چه حرفا خدا را هم کرد تفلکی حیوانکی حیف شد جالبه نه بابا دمش گرم these things are uh, routines in, um, in, a, in our language and uh, when um, teaching talk as interaction these are very useful little expressions that can uh, help our learners achieve fluency and um, also um, sound natural. Um, I would like to um, point out a number of issues when um, um, that need to be taken into account uh, when teaching speaking. The first one is the nature of the tasks that teachers should use. These tasks should have usually five char uh, characteristics or criteria. These characteristics have been proposed by Ur, I think, uh, 2012, or Or, whatever that is, the pronunciation. Um, the first uh, criterion of uh, tasks, speaking tasks, should be validity. It means that if you want to teach uh, talk as interaction uh, or talk as transaction, you have to uh, um, come up with ac um, um, activities that do teach this um, skill and um, for example paired or small group discussions would be uh, really helpful to teach talk as interaction uh, the second criteria is quantity tasks should be um, plentiful in uh, plentiful and enough for students to develop their skills in talk as interaction i'm just focusing on talk as interaction because of the time limitation. There are um, various activities to teach talk as interact, uh, transaction and performance in the chapter and hopefully you'll be able to read that chapter. Uh, tasks should be success oriented. It means that tasks should be designed in a way that um, they help um, learners achieve the, the uh, learning purpose. So they should not be failure oriented. Tasks should not be difficult. Um, giving them this um, feeling of success would enhance their motivation as well. Uh, next um, activity of a speaking task is um, heterogeneity of the task. It means that uh, tasks should be this devised in a way uh, that they cater to learners of different um, proficiency levels. When I was teaching um, Persian in the um, uh, in Portland State University or at Portland State University, I noticed that the population were multi-level and it was really difficult uh, to cater to everyone's needs. So I had to design tasks that that uh, actually took everyone's uh, proficiency level into account. Um, I have examples in the book and you can see um, um, those examples if you get the chapter or the book actually, which is useful source. Um, another uh, characteristic of tasks should be their interest. It means that um, they should be interesting enough to uh, motivate students to go on speaking. I have two minutes left um, just to make a number of points. The, the first one is that Many uh, speaking tasks in uh, textbooks are really productive speaking tasks and not creative uh, uh, speaking tasks. Uh, productive speaking tasks are designed to showcase um, the learner's linguistic ability, but creative tasks are usually those that cater to communicative competence and their communicative ability. Um, I should also not note that um, the division of productive speaking task and creative task doesn't mean that one is superior to the other. Uh, they both uh, are needed in our language classrooms, but um, we have to take into account that um, as learners progress in their language proficiency, we have to move towards um, language learning tasks that are creative. And uh, I have uh, mentioned some uh, articles related, related to uh, designing creative tasks. I end my discussion or 
this chapter by um, uh, citing Richards 2008, um, who says that in order to design speaking tests in um, classroom, you have to um, take in, into account whether you're designing tasks for uh, uh, speaking as interaction, transaction, or performance. Um, you also have to decide uh, which type of pedagogical strategies you need to um, employ in order to achieve those tasks. Um, so um, on that note, I close my um, talk and I hope that the information provided was useful to you. Thank you all and um, goodbye. Thank you very much, Musai, for your very informative talk. Um, now we will move to um, our Fourth panelist, Dr. Mahin Naz Mirdehkan, who is an associate professor of general and applied linguistics at the Department of Linguistics at Shahid Beheshti University of Iran. She is a multilingual linguist in Persian, English, and Hindu Urdu languages, and has mainly published on teaching Persian to speakers of other languages and typology and syntax of Indo Iranian languages. She is the corresponding author of Persian Framework for Re of Reference for Teaching Persian, 2017, Professional Series of Parfa, 2018, and Case Marking in Iranic and Indic Languages, 2018, among other publications. She will present her paper on teaching Persian varieties and dialects. Mahinaz, you can start. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, hi, dear all. Uh, I'm actually very excited to see you, uh, though on screen, and really appreciate uh, Dr. Puna Shabani's efforts for managing everything so excellently. Uh, due to the shortage of time, uh, we all know, I'll just skip many things which I would like to share with you uh, about this chapter. Uh, I'll uh, let the rest of it be for the QA session time, uh, which uh, I'm with you for your questions and would love to have your feedback on the project which we have presented here. Uh, as uh, dear Dr. Puneshabani mentioned just now, my presentation will be uh, actually on the 24th chapter of the Rothschild Handbook, uh, which is entitled Teaching Persian Varieties and Dialects, a Persian Reference Framework. I emphasize on the second part of the uh, title which I just mentioned. Uh, the chapter was uh, written by me and my colleague Said Reza Yusufi uh, and I'll do my best to summarize the research here. I'll give a brief sketch of the chap chapter and then focus on the second part uh, of which um, I think uh, it is very important uh, and needs more attention and consideration due to its being important uh, for the whole process of teaching, learning, evaluating, material developments, et cetera, et cetera, in Persian. And that is having a Persian reference framework. Uh, so the main focus here will be on that, uh, but I'll have a brief sketch of the other parts of it. Uh, and the project actually uh, is uh, actually the uh, Persian reference framework, which I mentioned. Uh, took around four years to be completed, and it was uh, done by a team of linguists and Persian language specialists, uh, including your colleague, Dr. Bakili Part, who is just here, and uh, my other colleagues, who are, who are also present here in the session. Uh, and uh, it took uh, around four years, but uh, finally it was uh, done, and uh, it's mainly based on the Common European Framework of Reference for Teaching Languages, shortened CEFR, uh, and uh, because of its necessity uh, for planning a well-structured framework uh, for teaching Persian and lack of uh, having such a framework in Persian, and also uh, its evaluation and getting, uh, uh, getting approved actually by uh, uh, MSRT uh, or uh, International S uh, Scientific Cooperation Center of uh, uh, MSRT in Iran. Uh, it was entitled the First Persian Reference Framework, uh, which uh, is shortened PRF, and I'll use it here in the paper. Uh, in general, uh, a brief out, uh, actually to give a brief outline of the chapter, this chapter uh, uh, includes seven sections and 12 appendixes. 
for those of uh, you who are interested in having a geographical report of Persian teaching centers, which I myself was very interested in it, finding which centers are uh, actually teaching Persian uh, throughout the world. So those of you who are, interesting, uh, who are interested in uh, these uh, centers, please uh, check the app appendixes, the 12 appendixes, which I'll mention, I'll give a brief review of them. Uh, and uh, in, regard, uh, in regard to these uh, actually uh, centers which are teaching Persian, we have given a numerical uh, report uh, in the chapter. And uh, I have to note that uh, there was uh, actually no organized or published source listing the institutes offering Persian teaching programs uh, other than those which are administered by MSRC. Those which are administered, we, have, we had a list of it. Other than that, we didn't have anything. So uh, uh, we uh, actually we have made and gathered the information online by online searches. Uh, this shows that it might change uh, in time. Anyhow, uh, the chapter, as I said, uh, is presented in seven sessions. Uh, it will have it has an introduction, historical review, and then it goes to modern Pers Persian varieties. Uh, in regard to modern Persian varieties, two subsections are given here, which are entitled core varieties uh, and peripheral varieties. Uh, Core and peripheral varieties may be a question for you that what does we mean, what do we mean uh, by core and peripheral varieties? Uh, actually, uh, we have given uh, introduction an introduction of the topic here, a typological sketch of these uh, varieties uh, and uh, the difference between core and peripheral, which I've just mentioned it very quickly here. The core varieties of Persian are represented as Iranian Persian, that is Persian or Farsi. Tajiki Persian, uh, Persian uh, uh, also mentioned as Tajiki, and Afghan Persian mentioned as Dari. So we have Iranian Persian, Tajiki Persian, and Afghan Persian, uh, which are the considered as the core varieties of Persian here. Uh, all of these three uh, varieties have their own a group of dialects. The group of dialects of each of them are considered as uh, peripheral varieties. So each of them having their own peripheral varieties. The main focus, uh, again, in between these core and peripheral varieties is on core varieties in the chapter, uh, and especially on Iranian Persian, that is Farsi. Uh, uh, and um, the numerical uh, reports which we have mentioned throughout the paper also shows that uh, the most teaching programs in different parts of the world are focused on Persian that is Iranian uh, Persian. And uh, in regard to variety, I have to mention that varieties, uh, variety is used here uh, as a cover term. Uh, and uh, we want to actually, we wanted to avoid using language, dialect, accent. Uh, so we used a variety here. And uh, this is a brief sketch of the, uh, the chapter. Uh, we also have in part four of this chapter, uh, we have uh, universities with Persian language programs focusing on varieties of Persian, that is Tajik and Dari. So uh, you'll have a list, you can see the list in appendix one. Uh, which uh, shows the institutes offering programs uh, in uh, Baluchi and Pashtu. Uh, uh, each of them in uh, one of the, actually in uh, 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 Appendix 1. Uh, for example, I just want, want to show uh, the way we have uh, given the list. For example, for Baluchi uh, in Appendix 1, we have in uh, the centers in Asia, and uh, in Europe and in North America, in uh, Asia, we have uh, in Pakistan, in two universities, in Iran, in one university, in University of Sistan and Baluchistan, and in Bahrain. Uh, I, I'll skip the rest of the uh, matters since we don't have time. Then we uh, I'll give a, a brief uh, review of the uh, fifth part of the chapter, which is a geographical quantitative report of teaching centers and programs. Uh, here we have a report of standard Iranian Persian teaching centers, uh, which is uh, presented by a classification among institutes teaching Iranian Persian inside and outside of Iran. So again, two classification we have here. Uh, 
uh, inside and outside of Iran. Uh, and it's seen in a triple category. The first category here uh, is institutes administered by Iranian Ministry of Science, Research and Technology, which is shortened as MSRT. So you'll see uh, the institutes which are administered by MSRT. Then the second and third classification are new classifications for teaching person. Uh, we have considered them as free institutes and cultural associations. So, uh, to see uh, actually uh, how this classification works, uh, you can see the fifth uh, part of the chapter and uh, the institutes inside uh, are uh, uh, administered by MSRT, which are inside Iran. Uh, you can see it uh, uh, in 16 universities inside Iran. We have the inst these institutes, which are again uh, mentioned uh, in the appendix. And outside Iran, uh, we have five, uh, actually MSRT uh, uh, directs uh, uh, the institutes in five uh, general regions as well as uh, universities within them. Uh, the matter is presented in uh, the uh, regions, uh, Europe, uh, 16 universities uh, is notified is appending in appendix third, three, uh, Caucasus and Commonwealth of Nations, uh, region countries, again, 21 universities mentioned in the appendix, uh, Asia and Oceania, uh, African and Arab countries, South American countries, and additional countries, which again, you can see in the appendixes. Uh, we have, as I said, we have two new classifications, free institutes and uh, cultural associations. By free institutes, which is the second category made here, uh, the classification is added to show the attention of non-government, uh, non-governmental institutes teaching Persian, which by its own shows the importance of Persian language uh, and the interests of learners around the world for learning Persian. So uh, again, our research shows nine institutes in North America, 39 institutes in Europe. Uh, which comes to, in general, to 50, uh, 46 free institutes in the regions. Again, for cultural associations, uh, a list of Persian programs labeled as cultural associations are provided here in the paper, which can be seen here as informal associations for teaching and learning Persian throughout the world. Uh, and the matter is considered uh, in four regions, considering Europe, uh, in four countries, including 26 associations in Canada, four, uh, seven associations in Japan, one association, and Australia, one association, and in general, uh, 35 cultural associations. Now we come to the main topic, which we are, I would like to uh, share with you about uh, Persian reference framework. Uh, actually, the necessity for having a well-structured framework for teaching standard Persian uh, is something uh, we all need to pay attention to. And uh, here we have shortened it as PRF. Uh, having such a framework can result in the production of suitable and applied educational contents, uh, contents according to the needs of learners in different regions of the, part, in, of the world and countries. So in this uh, part, actually, sixth part of the uh, chapter. We have talked about the necessity for developing a reference framework for teaching Persian to speakers of other languages, uh, a historical review of CEFR, uh, which is the theoretical basis uh, within which we have uh, created PRF, a Persian reference framework. Then we talk about the characteristics of a reference framework, then go on to a, a general approach in CEFR, requirements for a reference framework for language teaching, and reason for choosing CEFR as a theoretical basis for developing PRF. Actually, we uh, chose uh, CEFR as our, uh, as our um, uh, framework because it's, it's context-free, it's flexible, it's open. Uh, it's possible to revise uh, and it's possible to localize. It's uh, used for non-European languages uh, such as Japanese, Chinese, Arabic. So, uh, and uh, the sources was available also. Uh, uh, other than uh, CFR, we have other frameworks such as Axfel, which is used in America. But what we chose was CFR. We considered every uh, all of them actually. But uh, finally, we got to CFR, which was localized and used for Persian. Uh, now, the methodology which we used here. Uh, is that uh, uh, we need uh, a framework 
for Persian, which can uh, represent the general principles and shape the roadmap for us for developing and designing educational materials. And uh, it is very significant for us because, as you saw, we have different institutes around the world which are uh, uh, teaching Persian who are uh, actually uh, developing material. And having a roadmap for this development and designing educational materials is very important. Uh, several steps was uh, taken in developing P uh, PRF which I, uh, due to shorter of time, I'm not going to uh, concentrate on it, uh, but it's present in the paper and I'll be more than glad uh, to help any of you who will have any questions about it. Uh, it has some characteristics, the, uh, the PRF, it's uh, a comprehensive collection of grammatical, lexical and functional modules. Uh, it's uh, the special attention uh, here is on language learners' opinions, needs, and favorites, uh, uh, and it use uh, the use of expert opinion uh, of uh, Persian language teachers we had here, and uh, the flexibility of its structure is very important. In sum, this project uh, project has uh, been brought up using uh, CFR and uh, it's uh, localizing it for Persian. Uh, accordingly. PRF can be used for designing and planning educational courses and textbooks and providing a harmony and balance between different areas of teaching. Uh, uh, the results, uh, the data of uh, PRF uh, was actually demonstrate, uh, demonstrates uh, 278 lexical domains, 178 grammatical items, and 184 functions selected and graded in three levels of elementary, intermediate, and advanced uh, for TIPSO. Uh, according to uh, actually what we have mentioned as a PRF, we developed a series of books, uh, which we called PARFO. Uh, as you can uh, notice, we have PRF and according to PRF, uh, we uh, created a name PARFO, uh, which uh, provides a new integrated four skills course book series for teaching Persian for adults who want to use Persian in daily life and guides them from, from uh, par for one to par, uh, elementary level to par for two intermediate level and finally par for three which is uh, advanced level. This is uh, actually this uh, par for is mainly uh, and totally based on uh, the uh, what we have in PRF. Actually, uh, the uh, basic theoretical base is Persian reference framework. And uh, the, it has teacher's book, uh, student's book, and workbook together with the audio. And the teacher book has the tests, the necessary tests, and uh, actually uh, the tests for each set, each chapter, and also for uh, uh, midterm and final term. Uh, Yes, and uh, to conclude my topic, uh, uh, the, main, the, the aim of this chapter was to in, introduce different language programs uh, in teaching Persian, uh, and after having them and gathering them, uh, due to the difference of uh, uh, different places in the world, we came to the topic of having a reference framework for Persian for developing materials, and then uh, we introduced PRF and the books, uh, which uh, is written by a team of experts in Iran. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention, everyone, and I once more uh, thank uh, Dr. Pune Shabani uh, for uh, organizing this meeting, uh, and I'll be ready for any questions uh, uh, which if uh, your audience will have, and uh, also after that, uh, after the panel, uh, you can contact me by your email, which is given, and uh, also the uh, other possibilities, WhatsApp or Telegram. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Mahinas, for your very informative presentation. Now we will move to Dr. Amir Reza Vakilifad, who was the director of the Persian Language Center at the International University of Qazvin from 2013 to 2018. He has been teaching Persian language to foreign students since 1995 at this university. He received his PhD in education, second language didactics from the University of Montreal. In 2011, he established the Journal of Teaching Persian to Speakers of Other Languages, Iran's first academic periodical in the field in which he serves as director in charge and editor in chief. He is member of the Policy Making Council of SAMFA Standard Assessment of Persian Language Skills, 
and head of its scientific committee. He will present his paper on the development of a standard proficiency test. Anireza, you can start. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this virtual panel. I would like to thank Dr. Shabani, and I am happy to be here today to talk about development of standard Persian language proficiency tests for speakers of other languages. Many Iranian uh, universities have started to admit international students since 2000. They needed uh, the relevant instrument to assess the language proficiency of the Persian learners. As you know, language proficiency tests assess the learner's competence in a language regardless of the specific courses taken by the learners. But no standardized Persian language proficiency test was available for this significant purpose. This problem uh, led me to try to develop a valid and reliable Persian language proficiency test. Here I uh, try to describe the essential uh, com component, procedure, difficulties, and future uh, direction observed in the development of the standard assessment of Persian language skills, SAMFA, which is the acronym of the Persian equivalent. Uh, fundamental consideration in developing SAMFA. The approach to language test development begins by defining explicitly the quality of usefulness test usefulness compromising several characteristic or quality of language test such as construct validity, uh, reliability, impacts, and practicality. <coughs> validity refers to degree to which or accuracy with which an assessment uh, measure, uh, measures what it is supposed to measure. Reliability refers to consistency of test scores. That is, if a test is conducted in another time, it must approximately produce the same scores or results. Impact is its effects and uh, consequences on education and various aspects of society. Practically refers to the way a test is implemented, developed, and used according to human material and time resource available. SAMFA development. Three important states for SAMFA uh, development were planning, design, and uh, administration. The first phase, planning. At this phase, the purpose of the test is clarified, then a, need, uh, a needs analysis is conducted to determine the domain of language use and the essential language abilities. Characteristics of the target test takers are also identified and standards for the projected purpose are selected to identify the critical communicative functions and tasks, a number of detailed observation are made and recorded. The transcriptions of observed tasks are, uh, are studied to identify the features of general and academic discourse, which the learners need to learn. The objective of the general and academic samphas were clearly specified in terms of content, context, and uh, purpose of tasks. The operationalize the constructs of academic language proficiency, the lexical, grammatical, and textual characteristics of academic Persian language were described. The second phase, design. In the second phase, a set of constructs was uh, identified by a comprehensive review for assessing Persian language proficiency, language competence was broken down 
into listening, reading, writing, and speaking skills. Within these skills, learner performance was measured in terms of linguistics units such as uh, phonology, orthography, vocabulary, sentences, sentences, uh, uh, sentences structure, discourse, and pragmatics features of language. The specifications of, uh, for SAMFA were designed. They include information on content, such as operation, types and length of text, topics, readability, a structural range, vocabulary range, dialect, accent, and style, and also information on test structure, timing, medium ch uh, and channel, critical level of performance, and scoring uh, procedures. Operation uh, are tasks that the learners were uh, required to perform were uh, specified. For example, in the case of reading test, a selected number of tasks may include guessing the meaning of unfamiliar words from the context, recognizing the reference of grammatical structures, etc. A standard uh, Persian language proficiency test length and types of text. The reading comprehension test contained four or five texts. In general reading and listening test, a narrative and informative texts were used, but in the academic bonds, only informative uh, texts were applied. Uh, you, dear audience, you can, uh, you can see uh, the chapter and the length and the types of other skills are described in details. Topics. In general, SAMFA topics were la uh, largely general and related to everyday issues, life uh, changes, art, music, event, etc. In academic SAMFA, on the other hand, topics were chosen from various academic files and disciplines. Therefore, reading comprehension text, writing and speaking tasks dealt with topics in the file of engineering, humanities, social sciences, and medical sciences. Vocabulary and a structural range. Uh, the approximate range of lexical and structural domain uh, for this test was drawn from our book, Framework of Reference for Teaching Persian to Speakers of Other Languages. Dr. Midehkan and I and two other colleagues work on it, which is one of the most important research for, the, for teaching Persian language. Dialect, accent, and style. The dialect and accent that the learners are expected to demonstrate in a speaking test involves the formal one used in Tehran. In the listening test, informal style and colloquial language are used. Sunfall structures. The Sunfall structure was designed in a way that it would assess the learner's ability to use the language for communication. As such, it does not directly measure their knowledge of the language per se by itself. Language knowledge is usually assessed in the term of language skills and component. Basic language skills include reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Major language components involve grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation. Academic Sanfa had a modular structure. Four discipline-based modules uh, pro were provided covering social sciences, uh, engineering sciences, human sciences, and medical sciences. You can refer to the chapter for the following subtitles, number of passage and items, medium and channel, and also test duration. Critical level of performance. Levels of successful performance were determined and clarified in sample statements. For writing and speaking skills, degree of performance were determined in terms of accuracy 
appropriateness, domain, flexibility, and size included in SAMPA's guidebook and scientific framework. A specification of a scoring procedure and reporting format. In SAMPA, each aspect of a tax is scored separately. The separate scores that were given based on different criteria were assumed up to arrive at the resulting scores. The scoring rubric uh, for the writing, reading, speaking, and listening component of the SAMFA are, uh, are explained in the chapter. Writing and moderating items. In each test, texts were selected from various domain and subjects area to assure content validity and representation. Then the prepared items were handed to to expert member of scientific committee for careful examination. The third phase, the SAMFA administration. In the administration phase of SAMFA, a statistical uh, analysis is firstly conducted to examine test qualities, such as uh, reliability and item qualities, such as item difficulty and item discrimination. Secondly, qualitative analysis is conducted to discover Mis uh, misinterpretations, unforeseen responses, and, problem uh, and problematic items. Make evaluations of different kinds of items. To arrive uh, at suitable multiple choice item, some five items were examined in terms of item facility, item discrimination, and distractor analysis. Problem and difficulties. For further reading about the section of problem and difficulties, such as wash back, train the test score users, interrelation between content knowledge and language proficiency for academic SAMFA, the validity of uses and interpretations of SAMFA, limited evidence addressing validity, reliability, and fairness of rubric, you can refer to the chapter. Uh, you can also uh, see, you can see also more details about further uh, the directions. In the main chapter of the handbook, there are some information and suggestions about performance-based assessment computer assisted language assessment, integrated task-based assessment, Persian language teacher assessment literacy, exit test development. Here is a quick uh, recap of the main points of this chapter. And as a conclusion, I would like to say that SAMFA was launched in 2015. The significance of SAMFA is that it acts as a gatekeeping instrument to filter international uh, students of universities and let in the ones who are able to cope with the language domain of their academic files. Different universities are encouraged to set their own minimum scores and threshold level for academic Persian language proficiency according to their position on the ranking list of the university in the world. Uh, Ready-made and validated tests such as SAMFA that are administered several times each year could relieve Persian language teaching departments from spending time and money to develop their own tests. That was all I had to tell you about SAMFA. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your very informative talk. Um, now we will move to our last panelist, Dr. Negar Dawari Ardakani, who is an associate professor in Shahid Beheshti University and an honorary lecturer at the Australian National University Center for Arab and Islamic Studies in 2018 to 2020. She received her PhD in linguistics from the University of Tehran in 2007. She is a co-author 
of Persian Evaluative Morphology in the Edinburgh Handbook of Evaluating Morphology, 2015. In the last two decades, Dr. Davari has been teaching applied and theoretical linguistic courses and conducting research in language planning, sociolinguistics, and discourse analysis at Shahid Beheshti University and the Academy of Persian Language and Literature. She has published several books in these areas, including A Century of Persian Language Planning, 2011, Persian Language Planning, and The Language Attitudes of Persian Speakers, 2013. She will present her paper on Persian as a national language and minority languages. Megajan, you can start. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Hi, everybody, and thanks for attending my talk. I hope you're not that tired not to be able to listen to me. Uh, I'm happy that the topic is a bit different, so this will be a change of mood here. I would like to thank Pune and all her colleagues at the Institute of Islamic Studies, McGill University, for their hard work on organizing the present panel discussion. Today, I'm excited to discuss some of the background issues and challenges of implementing a multilingual education system, which is aimed at promoting Iran's linguistic and human capital, including minority languages, Persian and their speakers, that is the whole nation. Let me first try to portray some background issues and, and state the problem for you. Iran has been a multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multicultural country during its long history, as far back as the Achaemenid era, when inscriptions were written in various languages of the diverse ethnic religious groups that inhabited the then Persian Empire. The shift from multilinguality to Persian as a dominant language is believed to have occurred around four centuries after the advent of Islam through a gradual natural bottom top supra stratization process of standardization and officialization. Because of the high status of its literary works and the support it received by the society, it is clear that diachronic aspect of the survival, transformation, and dominance of Persian has been a matter of covert policy and not an imposition by a political power, a process that is also related to the continuing development of Persian in the countries it has been and is spoken. Persian has maintained its high status among Iranians throughout its history with almost no interference with the rights and opportunities of other languages speakers. However, mid 19th century radical socio-political changes affected the situation in some ways. During World War II, due to the inefficiency of the local government and interferences of foreign powers, Iran was divided by Britain and Russia. However, Reza Shah succeeded in unifying the collapsing country through his Persianification of the nation and also succeeded in building, lang in building a modern national identity through Persian language and literature and Iran's pre-Islamic history and culture. He ignored the multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, multicultural, and multi-religious reality of the Iranian state to the point that some groups tried to seek independence from the central government. Minority language speakers were offended by being deprived of using their mother tongues and practicing their cultures. And in a time in which not many of the ethnic populations could speak and comprehend Persian, a monolingual Persian literacy program was imposed on them which caused lack of confidence in the targeted populations because of the failures they experienced due to a neglected pedagogical basis. However, today the problem is partly solved due to the vast coverage of Persian media throughout the country and the very recent offering of a short pre-literacy program in provinces where students' mother tongues are not Persian. 
On the other hand, the broad coverage of satellites with ethnic language programs throughout the country, including the borderline provinces, made mother tongue languages more accessible to satisfy some identity needs of the speakers. Nevertheless, a 10 to 20% gap still exists between the literacy rates of Persian as mother tongue speakers and minority languages speakers. Despite the fact that multilingualism is the norm of language societies, most countries' educational systems, including Iran, are based upon national or official languages. And multilingualism has been neglected and disregarded as a natural norm of societies, relying partly on the stereotypical belief that there is an instinct connection between national unity and the use of a single official language, a belief which is today considered as a myth by many researchers who argue that using and valuing one language at the expense of excluding many others could create divisions, inequalities, and inequities. It is well established that mother tongues should be acknowledged because they contribute to building self-identities of their speakers. Neglecting them could lead to the formation of deficient identities that may ultimately threaten the nation's well-being. To pave the path towards a language in education policy aimed at socioeconomic development, I would like to walk you through some deeper aspects of the situation to see how an awareness of speakers' linguistic attitudes and a sound understanding of multilingualism could shed light on the problem and remove the unreal conflict supposed to exist between promoting a national language and cultivating minority languages. Of course, after a brief description of Iran's linguistic landscape. This talk will also reveal the non-neutral nature of standard languages, including the standard versions of minority languages the inequality of their speakers and the inevitable hierarchical relation of coexistent languages. This will provide us the required argument, arguments to question the simplistic ready-made solutions for Iran's minority languages policy and planning. Due to the shortage of time, I will finish the talk by just pointing to some pros, cons, and challenges of implementing a multilingual education plan in the contemporary context of globalization. Let's now take our first step and briefly review the linguistic landscape of Iran. Currently, 76 languages are spoken in Iran, of which 14 are non-Iranian and 64 are Iranian languages, and only 12 are non-indigenous languages. Seven languages are dying and 29 are in trouble three threatened and 26 shifting towards Persian. From the remaining 42 languages, Persian as Iran's national and official language is spoken by 98% of the population, including 61% as their mother tongue. Approximately, all the numbers are approximate here. Approximately 18% speak Turkish, 10% Kurdish, 2% Arabic, 2% Baluchi, 2% Lori, 5% Mozandarani, Talishi, Gilaki, Armenian, Assyrian, Georgian, and other languages as their mother tongues. The majority of Iran's minority language speakers live in borderline provinces. However, nowadays, due to an increase in mobility, minority language speakers have dispersed all over the country. Not to forget the allocation of a specific portion of mother university seats, Sahmiya Bandiye Konkur, to the many borderline provinces with minority language speakers since 1982 has also enhanced the mobility and mixture of the population. As you can see, the term minority language in the context of Iran refers to both non-indigenous languages like Azeri, Turkmen, Arabic, and Armenian, and indigenous languages like Kurdish, Baluchi, Lori, Gilaki, and Mazandarani. Thus, the term refers to speakers of minor languages, major languages, tribal, or ethnic and religious minorities with specific languages. 
As mentioned before, the majority of the languages spoken in Iran are Iranian indigenous languages, which have been used in the region and by their speakers for millennia. And hence, bi or multilingualism is the norm in at least 30 of Iran's provinces. And these bi or multilingual speakers identify themselves by complex, interesting layered patterns of cultural, ethnic, and linguistic affiliations, including their local languages along with the national language. They, as part of the nation, share a single cultural and historical heritage with other members of the nation. Even the so-called non-indigenous residents of Iran have lived in the land for several hundreds of years, up to millennia, and therefore are merged into the native population. They have greatly contributed to the nation's solidarity and sovereignty throughout the history. A quick look at Iran's constitutions, Articles 15, 19, and 20, shows that some fundamental rights, including the use of regional and tribal languages in the press and mass media, as well as teaching of their literature in schools beside Persian, are guaranteed for the minorities. However, the constitution has not overtly stated the right for the minorities to establish their own schools. Nevertheless, Armenians have had their own schools since 1833 in Tehran, Isfahan, and Urumia. And the language has been taught in Isfahan University as a Bachelor of Arts degree. And recently, Istanbul Turkish and Surani Kurdish have also been included in some university programs. Now, we need to go through the challenges of planning for minority languages in the context of a respected dominant standard national language that is Persian. Mother tongue-based multilingual education, which we will call it from now on MTB MLE, Mother Tongue-Based Multilingual Education, MTB MLE, which is based on the proposition that education in mother tongue is a linguistic right and emphasizes that effective learning is best achieved through learners' mother tongue has been introduced to acknowledge and nurture minority speakers. However, the approach has recently been criticized because of the unequal status of the languages involved. A criticism in line with Lane's criticism of the standardization process, which we will discuss in a few minutes. In other words, MTB MLT could not support the minority language speakers unless they have positive attitude towards their mother tongues. Davari, Mustafa, Bahiri, Darabide, and Ali Akbari and Darabi, through their attitude assessing surveys, respectively for Persian, Turkish, Kurdish, Arabic, and Lori, showed that there's no conflict between appreciating, using, and maintaining mother tongues, and at the same time using and acknowledging Persian. However, there has been no survey of attitudes towards the inclusion of minority languages in the public educational scheme. There might be some discontent on this because of an increase of students' study load, financial and academic burden of designing and implementing new curriculums, and establishing teacher training programs, documentation and standardization of the oral minority languages, and the probable stigma that the new standard will cause are among the challenges of implementing a multilingual education scheme. On the other hand, Iran's language authorities from the time of Reza Shah up to the present time have practically considered the cultivation of minority languages as a threat to Persian as the national language. And a laissez-faire, leave it alone approach has been taken. This hypothetical opposition is not merely taken for granted by some Iranian elites. It is an ideology taken for granted from when colonialism and nation states emerged throughout the world. Worth noting that Persian language and literature have long enjoyed the contribution of many Iranian poets, writers, and language experts whose mother tongue is not Persian. It is also interesting to note the first modern Persian primary school before the establishment of public nationwide schools by Reza Shah had been established by Hassan Roshdieh in Tabriz. 
Acknowledging this convergent contribution requires the emergence of a new discourse in Persian and minority language planning. A discourse based on the premise that no contradiction exists between promoting Persian as the national language and cultivating local languages as national minority languages. The formation of the discourse is primarily due to a deep understanding of the advantages of multilingualism in general and multi, multilingual education specifically and the reconsideration of the myth of one nation, one language. A belief that although has had a great role in uniting the country since the beginning of the 20th century could not be applied throughout the time and for every context and does not apply to today's global societies. Now we need to have a look at the issue of solidarity and identity in relation to so-called national and minority languages. After the advent of nation states, a common language has been considered as the only uniting element of a nation. This is true that languages have historically functioned as identifying symbols of states and nations. However, there are many other non-linguistic elements at work in shaping identities. And this is what the multidimensionality of identity means. Therefore, knowing the synchronic salience order of a nation's elements of identity is fundamental in devising and implementing the right language policies. Relying on the surveys on Iranian identity symbols, it is clear that Persian is among the most prominent symbols of Iranian identity to which local languages are added for the nation's bilingual speakers. On the other hand, I agree with Rasul, who states the monocultural, monolingual, metropolitan nation state no more exists. The linguistic aspect of the statement can be seen by a quick look at some numbers. There are 7,105 distinct living languages, while only 193 United Nations recognized states. Hence, an average of 39 languages are spoken in every country, so very few countries are monolingual. We can also see that the apparent unifying function of globalization that seemed to lead societies towards monolingualism has turned to cause the emergence of Englishes. Nevertheless, multilingual public education is not as popular as it should be because monolingual education is easier and less costly and could gain some kind of power for the speakers and for the states. Now, let's look at the discrimination embedded in language stand standardization very quickly. No doubt that a standardized national language is useful as a symbolic object, a social norm, and a political tool. It facilitates education, communication, economic and political running of a nation state, workforce training, and social cohesion. However, theories of standardization have critically been challenged as being ideological and discriminative. Lane sees standardization as prioritizing some forms and structures ahead of others, and therefore some speakers ahead of others on the basis of sociopolitical, cultural, and economic concerns. Standardization is a selection on the basis of the selector's priorities, which could delimit the linguistic rights of some groups and hence it is non-neutral. Consequently, multilingual policies, however originated to dismantle linguistic inequalities, may create unwanted inequality by their choice of standard variety. Hence, introducing multilingual education could not totally remove discrimination since the sociopolitical implications of languages could never be removed from them. We are now in a situation to look for a suitable multilingual education program for Iran. The inevitable advantages of multilingualism are, are well known. However, many technical, ideological, and discursive obstacles makes the implementation of multilingual education system immensely difficult. An example is some nations' concerns about penetration of loan words into the native language or a shift towards the dominant languages. 
for detailed discussion of how to facilitate the implementation process and to avoid the probable inequalities, I refer you to chapter 23 of the Rutledge Handbook edited by Pune. There you will see how accretive, balanced, and transitional multilingual education paradigms make use of different combinations of minority languages, national languages, foreign languages, and religious languages, considering the local, national, and international contexts of the related languages. An example to show the high, the high relevance of specific contexts is to consider the high economic value of Turkish, Kurdish, and Arabic to be included in a multilingual education paradigm because of the opportunities they afford for Iran's cross-border trading with its neighboring countries. To conclude, I suffice to point to the main step towards promoting and enriching Iran's language capital, including minority languages, which the recognition of minority languages as nations, which is then the recognition of minority languages as nations, common cultural and economic capital. It entails an awareness of the dynamics of using different languages. Through the emergence of this new discourse, we can promote speakers' self-esteem and ensure the whole nations, including the minority language speakers, access to high social and economic value channels. I would like to end this start by quoting from Ion Bowen Rees, a leading Welsh political thinker who has said, we bring up our children to speak their local language Welsh and be bilingual, not for the sake of the language, but for the sake of our children. Thank you. Nagarjan, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Um, so now our presentations uh, have come to an end. So I would like to thank once again our panelists for their um, excellent presentations and informative presentations today. Um, I'm going to read some of the questions that are written in the chat section. If you still have questions, you can continue typing and I will try to read them. Um, uh, we are also waiting for the director of the Institute of Islamic Studies, Dr. Um, Michelle Hartman um, to give a few words of welcoming, but I guess she's not here yet. So I'm going to um, read the questions now and then while we are waiting for Professor Hartman to come. So this question is by um, Shahla Adel for everyone. So whoever wants to answer, I think this is very relevant. So I will start with this question. She says, I was wondering if there are any new Persian language specific teaching techniques and strategies developed in Iran that we can use to teach our English speaking students more effectively? Okay. Yes, yeah. Marina. Uh, thank you, Dipuna. Uh, actually, as uh, I noted in the chat also, uh, the series of PARPO, which uh, I mentioned uh, throughout my lecture, uh, is uh, from uh, pre-A1 level to C2, and it includes uh, actually uh, useful techniques for teaching Persian in practice. Uh, I'll send the link for those who are interested in having the books. Uh, it's uh, The ebooks are available on a talk, a talk show, uh, and uh, those who are interested can uh, have it from talk show site. Perfect. Please, uh, you can put it in the chat so that we can all see. Yes, Anybody? I just Thank you. Anybody else has an answer to this question is welcome to answer it. Any other panelists? It shows how uh, we need such materials, you know, um, on a, in a national and international level. Uh, may I also add something to what Mahina said? Uh, apart from the books that uh, we have all developed during these years, uh, I think uh, our friend and colleague can check the website of the English program of the University of Texas Austin on which all the um, international web-based systems have already been introduced. Thank you very much. I think the question was more specifically for what has been done in Iran. 
So any, is there any new Persian language specific teaching technique and strategies that is developed in Iran that we could use? So I guess if they go and read your chapters, they're going to find some answers to this question. So I'm going to move to the next uh, question. Would yes. I, I, would, I would also like to add that um, we are not looking for new techniques and uh, new strategies. We, well, pretty much know these techniques and strategies. It depends on how teacher is, um, you know, creative enough in using these activities and um, backing them up with, uh, you know, appropriate materials. So we are, we, I don't think we should be looking for more, you know, techniques and um, strategies. They are already there. We have to be just uh, uh, able to use them efficiently. Exactly. I think that was the question as how we could how we can adapt the already existing techniques for Persian. And um, so yes. I guess they, they can, you can, we can refer them to the, to your chapters and um, which are very informative and some answers can be gotten from there. The, the second question is for Dr. Nushi actually, for Musa um, by Shahla Adel. So she says, one of the challenges for our students is that Persian is a diglossic language, like you mentioned as the differences in the two registers are often confusing for them, especially when it comes to using the spoken register. Are there any comprehensive published resources to make learning these differences easier for the learners? Um, I think Dr. Uh, Mahmoudi Bakhtiari would be in a better position uh, to answer this question. But when I was writing uh, the chapter, I have found these uh, two Persian sources that uh, introduce, uh, let me, uh, let me, um, yeah, I copied them here in the chat room. Um, these two sources told me a lot about these differences and um, burst, based on the personal experiences of the author, some techniques were offered, but the unfortunate uh, side of these um, references is that they are in Persian. I don't know whether the, uh, the uh, person who asked the, the question can read Persian or not, but these are two sources. I'm sure Dr. Bakhtiari and other uh, professors here can also suggest sources that can help with this challenge. Would you like to uh, thank you, that? Musa. That's very kind of you. As a matter of fact, the issue of diglossia in Persian was something that I addressed in this book, Trends in Iranian and Persian Linguistics, which is published by Muton de Gruyter in Berlin, in which uh, I have been able to prove that Persian is a mellow meth form of a diglossic language. And in our books, Farsi Beyond Muslim, we usually have different Taking, usually, usually have different examples and experience and um, well, as a matter of tasks that the students are supposed to fill out different tables in which one of them is the spoken form, the other one is the written form. And it, it seems that we have to teach them simultaneously. There is no other choice because uh, when the students are watching the TV, when they are watching movies, they are facing the spoken language, which is very important. Thank you very much. Um, I noticed that our director um, of the Institute of Islamic Studies, Professor Michelle Hartman joined us. Thank you very much. So I would like to um, give the floor to Dr. Hartman to say a few words because she might be very busy and I really appreciate that she came to our panel. I was going to say, don't interrupt. This sounds really, really interesting. And it sounds like it's just, you know, there's so much going on here. Um, even though we're virtual and we're on this very strange, um, <laughs> you know, going to meetings in other countries on our computers, um, I really just wanted to welcome everybody to the Institute of Islamic Studies on behalf um, of you know Pune and the Persian program, but all of us and welcome and thank you so much for participating and joining in what I'm sure is a really, really rich um, discussion. I'm sorry I can't stay long, but I just wanted to, to say those words of welcome and I'm sorry I couldn't be here at the beginning, um, but really welcome and thanks for coming and um, carry on. I don't wanna interrupt the discussions because it sounds like it's going really, really well. So, and thanks Pune, of course, as always for organizing such a wonderful event for us. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Okay, so I'm going to read the second question, the third question, which is for um, Sorry, yeah. Behrouz. Yes, Mahina. I get, just I had a, a short reply for uh, uh, the question which was mentioned before about uh, the, the two forms of Persian. Actually, in the teacher's book of Parfa, we have mentioned about how to teach the two forms of uh, the Persian for uh, actually non-Persian speakers. And it's a step-by-step -step move for teachers, even those who don't have the experience of teaching. Uh, we have used uh, actually uh, interesting techniques for teachers who can uh, make their uh, classes very interesting for the audience. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is uh, for Behrouz um, by Shahla Adel. She's asking, what is your take on mastering grammar um, is the foundation in the proficiency of a language? Focus on form or focus on forms? Should grammar be taught implicitly or explicitly? How about the PACE model? Well, uh, this depends on the institute and the approaches which are taken. For example, usually those people who are learning the language as this, uh, as the speakers of the second heritage would like to learn the language in the context. Therefore, teaching grammar would be implicit. But for example, for the students who are doing their uh, graduate studies in your own institute, uh, they are usually adult people who do not have a long time to learn the language in context and prefer to learn uh, the grammar of the language first and apply all the words that they know to the, to the grammatical issues. Therefore, I cannot provide you with mm, a, a very mm, straightforward uh, notice that teach grammar or not. But in case you are supposed to teach grammar, then you have to uh, observe such uh, problems and uh, such obstacles which may uh, face you. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to answer? Yes, to I question? would like to add here um, that um, it, uh, Dr. Bakhti already pointed out, it depends on the context and on the uh, learners. Here, uh, language learners who are uh, learning Persian, I mean in Iran, I've noticed that they are multilingual and they already know how to uh, approach grammar from their previous experiences. So um, I would say that their, gram their approach to grammar is predetermined, but um, one important thing is uh, uh, most of the grammatical items are teachable through implicit um, approach to, uh, you know, to teaching. But the point is uh, there are some features in Persian that do require explicit instruction. And uh, again, it's not either or, you know, um, whether we have to t adopt this approach or that approach. You have to look at the um, the grammar in point two. Thank you very much. Um, we have a series of questions by Ali Dabak, who is asking mostly about the cultural conceptualization and cultural concepts. So I'm going to read his last question because there are quite a few, which uh, is addressed to any of the uh, panelists. So he's asking, how can we deal with teaching Persian cultural schema in teaching Persian to speakers of other languages? I mean, Persian cultural conceptualizations, not just some big C or little C cultural points related to the Persian culture. Uh, well, uh, I would like to thank Mr. Dabok for this very good question. Of course, as, uh, as much as I'm concerned, uh, it has nothing to do with grammar because, well, you know quite well what linguistic relativity and linguistic determinism is. Uh, according to Sapir Whorf hypothesis, uh, the grammar of a language has nothing to do with the culture of the language, with the culture that the language is supported with. But the lexicon of that language may mirror, may reflect the culture of that language. I would like to um, refer you to the works that my colleague Zahra Abul Hassani Chime has done because she has published plenty of articles on the relation of uh, teaching culture in language classes. Thank you. Anybody um, else? Again, would like? uh, I, yeah, Dr. Um, go ahead. Yes, please. Sorry, uh, just I wanted to mention, I uh, typed this uh, in the chat also, uh, some, we have uh, in, within the teacher's book, again, 
uh, we have mentioned some points in each lesson for teaching the cultural points related to the student book. So uh, again, I refer uh, you to the teacher's book, which uh, I found it uh, myself. It was very interesting for me to write the book with my colleagues. Um, Ali, uh, may I add something here? Um, Ali is uh, actually uh, pursuing cultural linguistics developed by uh, late Professor Arza Charifian. And um, I, I, um, I would like to add here that um, uh, cultural linguistics sees uh, all aspects of uh, language, whether it's grammar, vocabulary, idioms, all these things being uh, uh, culturally laced. And um, Ali has um, said whether cultural con uh, conceptualizations um, can be taken care of um, in teaching the Persian as a second language or not. Actually, I have not found um, this as a problem. I, this is something interesting for students to know that how culture determines the base of grammar, how culture determines the base of vocabulary, how culture uh, determines the base of, let's say, uh, the basis of uh, idioms. For example, in English, um, uh, well, that is my area of expertise, in order to teach um, the um, idi ang anger idioms, they talk about boiling and uh, exploding, okay? So this is the, um, this is the cultural uh, basis of the idioms. Um, regarding grammar, it's also the case. Uh, some grammatical structures are developed based on the culture. And um, well, Dr. Bakhtiri talked about the lexical um, uh, side of the vocabulary, but Ali, I'm sure um, um, my experience um, tells me that cultural conceptualizations and defining uh, how culture is embedded in the language, in, whether in uh, grammar, vocabulary, or uh, let's say uh, idioms, help me actually um, make my students motivated to learn more about these, um, these um, linguistic components. Thank you. Anybody else would like to add anything? Negajan? Yes. Uh, Punijan, I just wanted to, uh, recalling my experience at uh, Australian National University, uh, I recognized that new generations do not, um, you know, have the necessary grammatical competence. Mm -hmm. So they sometimes do not know, do not even know the simple uh, grammatical labels. So, this is a hard task, I think, for the teacher to uh, teach grammar explicitly. However, we need to do it. But I think um, um, because I had this, this problem while I was teaching, I was looking for, as uh, Miss Adele asked, uh, for strategies to overcome this obstacle. Uh, so. Uh, um, I went through an article by Agha Golzadeh, Perdos Agha Golzadeh, uh, who has devised some cognitive approaches uh, for teaching Persian subjunctive. And as Ali mentioned, uh, and everybody knows that cognitive approaches based on, uh, you know, cultural uh, concepts of any language. So um, I think, to think of strategies, cognitive approaches could be uh, useful. And something else that I was um, just thinking about and have prepared some um, very preliminary, uh, you know, um, notes on it was a discourse aware language teaching approach, which I think could solve some of these problems. Thank you very much. Um, so. The last question is for, dear, for Dr. Bakhtiari uh, by Aliya Nehim. She's asking you, first she's thanking you for your presentation. She says, I believe if you change the tense in the example you make for the English speakers, you may be able to make the idea of number discord in Persian easier to understand for English speaking learners of Persian. Instead of making the example in past tense, nobody ate their food. 
if you use simple present tense or present progressive tense, nobody eats, nobody is eating their food. Uh, the English speaking Persian learners will see a similarity. Also the progressive adjective, sorry, the possessive adjective there is a replacement for his or her in recent years. If this point is explained again, the learners will see a similarity. Would you like to answer Dr. Bakhtiari? Yes, yes. Well, uh, I'm afraid not a great change will take place in case we change the tense because هیچ کس غذایش رو نمیخوره غذایشون رو خوردن هیچ کس غذایش رو نخورد the case that i'm addressing is the case of negation and not the case of tense uh, in other words when we when we make use of همه and turn it to هیچ کس for negative for neg negativizing the word then uh, همه غذایشون رو میخورن then هیچ کس will impose a negative function uh, impose a negative form to the sentence that that was the case that i was addressing so unfortunately with changing or, or fortunately i don't know it is not a case of fortune um, changing the tense does not make a great change in what I, I was addressing thank you very much anybody would like to answer this question though it was for dr bakhtiari Okay, we have one last question here by Mohammed Nastaran. I think it's addressed to Negar. Uh, so he's saying, I would like to know if there is any special solution to localize minority languages in our educational system, while families themselves are fond of national language and inhabiting uh, somewhere that the language is flowing. Uh, thank you very much for your question. As I mentioned, uh, I think the basic thing uh, is to, um, uh, you know, uh, is to create a new discourse about the, you know, conflict between um, my minority languages, which I call national minority languages, and national language. So if we um, remove this opposition, which is believed to be, which is supposed to be between uh, um, teaching the two languages, you know, I mean the group of minority languages and the national language, then the things would become much easier by using the applied methods of multilingual teaching uh, as mother tongue language and uh, other methods uh, which are used in other countries. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, if there is any other point that you would like to make about any of the questions or if there is something that came to you, dear panelists, you want to add? This is uh, John, I just wanted to say something that you kindly uh, introduced me as uh, the author of the books for CPL Museum and Persian for Dummies. I would like to clarify once again that I was a co-author of these books. The other authors of for CPL Museum are dear Dr. Mahmoud Ghafari and dear Dr. Hassan Zul Fakhari and for uh, Persian for Dummies they are Dr. Mahmoud Ghafari and Dr. Fakhari Shalsi. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Anybody uh, else would like to make? I would, I would yes. like to ask one question, ask you one question. Uh, what are your Persian teaching programs? I mean, teacher, do you have any courses to educate teachers? Do you have um, enough students there to have multiple teachers? Are you uh, involved in teaching yourself or do you train other teachers? What do you do in terms of teacher education there? Sure, at McGill we have, um, it's me, and then there's Pro Professor Prashan Keshav Murthy, who is in charge of uh, Persian literature, but he also teaches advanced Persian. We have uh, four full years of Persian at McGill. I take care of the first three years, so introductory, lower intermediate, upper intermediate, each of them has two semesters. And then they will go to Professor Keshav Murthy to take advanced Persian and Persian literature. And um, if someone joins you as a teacher, um, do you provide any training programs? Unfortunately, we don't have any training programs. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if there is any for Persian. Maybe it would be nice to have a training program. Uh -huh. 
I don't think Saudi Foundation has got um, has actually held several teacher training programs. Yes. And um, I've uh, taught, for example, and Dr. Bakhtiari, Dr. Uh, Mir Dehan, they all taught um, those courses. And I was um, wondering whether you have such programs uh, yeah. overseas or not, yeah, especially um, at my. Yeah, at McGill we don't, but um, most of the people who are in charge of Persian language programs, at least, well, in North America and Europe that I know of, they already have a, a master's or a PhD in a, um, in a related field. So teaching or linguistics or related fields. But uh, I think I would like to ask uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Nahal Akbari, who is here. I think in Maryland, they do have some um, teacher training, right? Nahal John, can you please uh, give us information if you are offering any teacher training courses there? Nahal? I think I can hear Nahal. Something is going on. Okay, so maybe Nahal can get back to us when she comes back to her desk. Um, is in the meantime that we are waiting for Nahal, is there any other questions that you would like to ask the panelists? So um, I guess you can directly write to Professor Akbari at the University of Maryland to ask for that question. And um, I, um, yeah, my point is that we need a, an OSFA, uh, real, real OSFA teacher training program. Saudi Foundation has actually started the initiative, but they asked um, several professors, including me, to teach there, but my orientation was actually TEFL, and I uh, could not really link Persian and TEFL, uh, Persian and OSFA, no, I'm sorry, TEFL and OSFA. And uh, we need a course that is specifically designed for OSFA. You know, it, um, uh, it has to be a teamwork. Um, we have it, as I said, in uh, Saudi Foundation, but we do need that overseas, a program that is specifically designed for OSFA. Thank you. Nahal, are you there? I can hear Nahal's baby. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for the information about uh, Saidi. I'm sure that uh, our colleagues are going to search and um, get the information um, that they need. Um, so if you have any other questions for the panelists, you can ask. If not, I guess we can call it a panel. Uh, I just want to add one very final issue that uh, Musa John said OSFA. I would like to say that the first program, the first MA program of OSFA teaching Persian to non-speakers of Persian was established at Alame Tabatabai University and it was basically due to the efforts of Professor Miramadi. I would like to acknowledge it once again. Thank you. Um, it's uh, everybody in the chat, a few um, participants would like to have your contact details. So um, I can just copy paste your emails or is that, is that okay, panelists? Sure. sure. It's okay with me. Sure, sure. great. <laughs> okay. We'd be glad to have it. So here you are. And you have mine, if need be. Okay, so if you don't have anything, um, any other question to ask, I guess um, we can close the panel today. Thank you so much for your excellent talks. We really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for coming from Iran. I mean, this is just amazing. At least 
Well, pandemic has been terrible for all of us, but it has had one advantage, and that is we could gather together virtually at least until we can meet some proper way in Iran. <laughs> thank you thank all you so very much. And thank, thank you. you all thank you so much for this meeting. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, all the participants. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.